Welcome everyone. I am Celeste Schaefer Snyder, Director of Video Programs and Social Media at Children and Screens, Institute of Digital Media and Child Development, and your host for today's Ask the Experts webinar, PITR, IKR, Youth in Communication in the Digital Age. In case you don't already know, those acronyms stand for Parent in the Room and I Know Right, and both are commonly used acronyms with modern teens. Acronyms, emojis, GIFs, and memes, the world of texting, social media, and other forms of digital communication have completely changed the face of interpersonal communication, from the how to the why and when. While every generation of youth has had their own preferences and styles of communication, complete with new slang and subversions of existing rules, the very nature of communication changes when it takes place across digital platforms, for better or for worse. Smartphones and global connectivity also mean that we can communicate whenever and wherever we want. But for children growing up communicating across digital platforms, sometimes alongside in-person communications and sometimes in place of it, what are the impacts? How do these digital conversations affect their understanding and expectations of normal communication? These digital spaces also bring additional risk to online communication, making our conversations more public and permanent than ever before. How can we ensure that children have the skills, knowledge, and awareness they need to communicate effectively and safely online? These are just some of the questions that our panel of experts hope to answer for you today. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Anne Cameron. Anne Cameron served as chair of an interdisciplinary committee for the Canadian government on the social implications of communications technologies. In this capacity, she wrote UNESCO policy papers on media technologies in global education. Her studies of intimate relationships have led her to examine the crisis of confidence of children and youth in their on and offline communication skill development pre and post pandemic. Welcome, Anne. Thanks, Celeste. I am simply delighted to moderate this wonderful webinar. My lab hears from teachers, parents, and teens themselves, some of whom you will hear from today, about their lacking confidence in communication, both online and face-to-face. Our panelists will have important information to share with you and intriguing suggestions about how to address their findings and your concerns. So our first panelist is Dr. Sherry Turkle, and she is a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and founding director of the MIT Initiative on Technology and Self and a pioneer in the study of how digital culture changes not just what we do, but who we are. Her pathfinding books include The Second Self, Life on the Screen, Alone Together, and my personal favorite because it sp spurred quite a bit of my research, Reclaiming Conversation, and most recently, her memoir who I, with that, that I have not yet had a chance to read, the Empathy Diaries. I look forward to that, Sherry, and I look forward to what you have to say today. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I love that introduction. Thank you so much, Anne. I'm such a fan of yours, too. Um, well, let me just get right into it. There's uh, an increasing catalog, <laughs> increasing evidence of a catalog of harm from our lives on the screen, and particularly on how social media under undermines adolescent development. That's kind of a given. Um, and in fact, things are so bad that when Facebook wanted to start an Instagram for under 13 year olds, it hid its internal research about how teenage girls felt after being, uh, after beginning to use Instagram. Uh, there was UK research that showed 13% of UK teen girls said that their suicidal thoughts became more frequent. 17% said that their eating disorders got worse. 32% said that when they felt bad about their bodies, Instagram made them feel worse. This isn't kind of an isolated study. This is more kind of um, uh, a banal study of Instagram and its effect on teens. But Facebook hid those kinds of results and uh, actually was going to proceed with its under 13 Instagram plan until, as you all know, a whistleblower brought all of this to light. Um, now, though those kinds of harms focused on content, what teens saw and how it made them feel about their bodies, their friendships, um, their self-love, uh, fear of missing out, fear of their um, bodies uh, and social, of their bodily and social incompetence. But beyond those effects, I'd like to talk about how screen life inflicts other harms 
can work independently of specific content. And that's been kind of the focus of my work, and it's what I'd like to draw your attention to today. So consider how Screen Life teaches us a particular notion of efficiency. Screen Life has an aesthetic that says that the difficult will be made easy, the rough will become smooth, and that which had friction will become friction free. Because from its very beginning, the new digital world wasn't supposed to be just friction free in the sense that economic transactions would go more smoothly with expediencies such as electronic funds transfer. The vision was much more ambitious. That the goal was to minimize and even eliminate social friction, interactions that might cause emotional stress. Screens were supposed to teach us to see the stress of human relationships as a problem that technology could solve. Screens teach us, in fact, that vulnerability is a problem that technology can solve. But actually, life teaches young people, life teaches adolescents one thing, just as screens are trying to teach them another. Because face-to-face -face interactions with peers teach adolescents, in fact, teaches everybody that when we stumble and lose our words, it's uncomfortable, but we can come closer to each other. Screen life suggests new connections that allows us to edit our thoughts, to self-curate. Life teaches the importance of imperfect presence. While on the screen, we feel less vulnerable. We find ways around a certain kind of conversation, the kind that's open-ended and a little scary. Life teaches the connection between empathy and attention. People respond to commitment and deliberateness. When you put away your phone to have a conversation, that decision counts. People care about your offer of attention. Empathy is built on such small gestures the ones that communicate that you don't know what someone else has to say, but you want to learn. Consider this classic study that even a phone turned off and turned face down on the lunch table does two things to a conversation. First, it moves the conversation to more trivial matters because no one wants to anticipate an interruption while talking about something important. And second, the people having lunch somehow feel less invested in each other because even a silent phone, a turned off phone, a turned on its back phone disconnects us. My studies of college students in the 30 years prior to 2009 show a study, a fascinating study in 2009, that is the year before cell phones came on the scene that show a 40% drop in empathy, simply measured by the ability to put yourself in the place of another person in the story. Life teaches that to get to empathy, you have to take your time, but technology offers that world that exalts efficiency. A college junior explains to me that dorm life has taught her what she calls the seven minute rule. It takes seven minutes, she says, to know where a conversation is going because it takes that long to get into the rhythm and the pace of another person. And while she's talking, I'm thinking, oh God, this woman is my goddess. But then she says she hardly ever waits for those seven minutes to pass. She loses patience and she takes out her phone whenever the conversation falls a little silent. More than this, she says, she can't tolerate what she calls the boring bits. The boring bits. Now that's how we've come to talk about the hesitation and pauses, the natural rhythms of face-to-face -face human conversation. And in part, we denigrate the spontaneous pathway of human conversation because social media offers us an alternative a rush of constant simulation, you know, those reels, the, those curated responses. We come to think that this is how life is supposed to be. 
but it turns out that a capacity for boredom and even boredom in company, boredom at a dinner table, is one of the most important developmental achievements of childhood. Neuroscience teaches that when we experience boredom, the brain is replenishing itself. We're laying down the pathways for a stable sense of self. When bored, we learn to go within ourselves and develop our imagination. With our technology encouraged intolerance for boredom, there's another casualty, an intolerance for solitude. A classic study of college students asked if they would be willing to sit alone without a book or a smartphone for 15 minutes. The students say yes, for money, definitely. And when the researchers go further and asked, well, do you think you'd want to give yourself electroshocks during this time? The students say, no way, they're horrified. But in fact, after six minutes of being alone without a book or a phone and with a handy electroshock machine in the room, a significant number of students, men and women, do begin to give themselves mild electroshocks rather than sit quietly with their thoughts. The capacity for solitude and why I'm mentioning it is important because it is essential to your capacity for relationships. If you can't be alone with yourself, and of course this is what social media is undermining, when you turn to others, you don't hear them. You're not learning to hear them as they really are. You're turning them into who you need them to be to support your fragile sense of self. So solitude supports empathy. If you don't learn to be alone, you will only know how to be lonely. So technology may make us feel less vulnerable because we have these controlled exchanges but here is what we know about life. We lose out personally and as citizens in democracy when we don't take the time to talk to each other. When we don't know how to listen to each other, especially to other people who are not like us. And on the internet, we listen to fewer and fewer people who don't share our opinions. In today's political climate, we need our young people to develop the very skills that screen time erodes. Slowing down to hear someone else's point of view, waiting those seven minutes, valuing those boring bits. If we reclaim our attention and our capacity for solitude, our young people will have a better chance to reclaim our communities, our democracy, and our shared common purpose. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sherry, for this beautiful, although sometimes alarming, big picture of technology's role in our lives and in communication. You've shown us some of the strengths and the drawbacks of digital communications and some of the key differences, the individual differences in communication that um, we're all struggling with. I have a question from the audience that I thought you might like to play with a little bit. And it is uh, from a parent who says, my son barely holds a real, a real in-person conversation anymore. He wants only to communicate online. How would you suggest help us intervene on this? Really? Well, what, I, what I suggest is what I call sacred spaces in the home, where as a family, you just decide that there are places in the home and in the, home, the life of the family where there is talk, not text. And the easiest ones to do are around meals and meal preparation and in the car. And um, I like that better than saying, you know, some people do a tech Shabbat, you know, say one day a week we're doing technology. But I, for me, it's been more organic when I've worked with families to say, you know, there are some places that we come together where no one is going to use a phone. And I find mealtime and uh, being in the car, because the one who's driving is not 
texting. I'm not texting, I say to my daughter, my teenage daughter, I'm sitting here, I wanna talk to you. This is my time to talk to you. And if you do it, you know, I mean, you'll get pushback, you'll get resistance, but the meal times, car times, these are places where it's talk times. And I think that if, if parents come to that conversation really informed and really believing in what a life that's really just on social media, the, the things it does to people's heads, you know, like, for example, teaching them that oppositional conversation is the, is the conversation they learn um, and teaching them and saying to them, you know, there's another kind of conversation, another kind of discourse that you will learn by just chatting with me. And I'll just, I'll just end this by saying, so I really, I think it is by creating, to make a short answer, it's by creating these sacred spaces and by informing teens about what they're losing by not having those kinds of conversations. And I'll just end by saying, my students would rather text than talk, would rather talk to me online and come to see me in person. And I say to them, um, you know, why? And they tell me that they want my mentoring to be perfect and they want to ask me a perfect question, a perfect question to get a perfect answer. And I say to them, that's not mentoring. I want you to ask me an imperfect question so I can give you an imperfect question and answer and say, not good yet, come again later. See you next week. It, because it's not yet perfect, come again, let's work on it more. That's the relationship that makes for a true mentoring relationship. And then when you look at mentorship across the life cycle and the mentors that matter, it's that across the life cycle mentorship not a perfect answer, question and a perfect answer. Those are the relationships that make the difference. Tell your child that they're looking for mentorship, not perfect answers and perfect questions. And from their parents, they're looking for relationships of imperfection, 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 but relationship. The good enough relationship. Yeah, they're looking for relationship. What we need to learn is, I mean, I guess my bottom line as a psychologist here is what we need to learn is a capacity for relationship, not a capacity that the internet is teaching us that we can get better in computer psychotherapists. They tell me they'll get more information from the computer psychotherapists than I could ever give. It has more information. And I say to them, well, but it can't form a relationship with you. That's my specialty. That's the specialité de la maison, you know? So we, the, the culture is pushing towards a culture of information. And we have to teach our students and our children, no, we need to move towards a culture of relationship. We have to reclaim that because really that's what we're missing. So it's both so very simple and also very complex. Thanks so much for starting us off with this big picture, Sherry, and I'd like us now to move on to our next panelist. Richard Geary is the founder of the nonprofit organization, the Institute for Responsible Online and Cell Phone Communication, IROC2. He is also the creator and host of, a pub, of the Public and Permanent podcast, the author of numerous cyber safety and citizenship books, and has been a featured um, speaker at many national conventions and media outlet, outlets, and he's just come in from one of these uh, sessions that he has had. Um, and I'd like to welcome Richard, who's going to present some do's and don'ts of online communication, what we can teach our kids. 
Well, yeah, thank you so much, uh, first of all, for having me today and for the privilege of your time. I'm going to do my best to give you about 70 minutes of information in 10. So sit back, relax, don't listen slow, all right? Um, what I'd like to do is just start off by giving the information that we give everybody we speak to. What, we, what we've done is we've passed out very powerful tools to everybody on the planet, but we never really gave any uniform thought system on how to use it. And so as we pass these tools out and we have people get into trouble, we slap labels on their behaviors, and then we come in and talk about it. And it's almost like we gave everybody on the planet a book of matches, waited for them to burn their houses down, and then brought them in for the fire safety workshop. And in our, our nonprofit, our whole goal is to say, look, you know, we keep having these problems, and these are effects. Why are we not working on fixing the cause? And the cause of almost every issue you hear about in the digital world stems from right here, the decision making. And so how do we fix cause? We install what we call the golden rule of the 21st century. And what is the golden rule of the 21st century? It's this extremely important preventative mindset right here. Hey, am I okay with what I'm about to put into a world built for communication being communicated? Would I be okay if it wound up public? And permanent. Now, is that an absolute truth? Does it mean everything we do will absolutely be public and permanent? Of course not. But as we all know, watching this, it could be instantly, right? And why? Because that's why we have it. Because if something amazing happens to you today and you want to share that photo around the world, you can do it from the seat you're in, and we love it for that. Does something incredible happen in your family's life and you want to capture it forever? Drop it in your cloud, leave it there, and you can save it forever. The point is when humans want to make content public and permanent because it will help them get into college, get a job, get a scholarship, or be TikTok famous, they can do it. But when do problems happen for humans in a digital world? It's when they take that exact same tool that they love because it lets them make things public and permanent when it's going to work for them. But then they do things and say things in that exact same tool, and they don't want that information to get out. Well, it's not an absolute truth. It is the evolution of a very important mindset we've all learned from a very young age. Playing with fire can burn. This right here is not an absolute truth. It's a very important preventative mindset. I could fool around with this all webinar. It's not gonna, it doesn't mean I'm going to get hurt. What it means is the chances that I'll get hurt will go up if I keep fooling around with a powerful tool. But that's true with any tool, a car, a drill, a hammer, a fork. The point is if we fool around with tools, risks go up. Fool around with tools that connect us to 4 billion people instantly, then risks go way up. So starting today, whether you're holding it or you're wearing it, it's an app you've heard of or you've never heard of. If you can help your children stop and think before they turn it on, Hey, before you turn that tool on, are you okay with what you're doing being public and permanent? And not like the mindset shouldn't be, holy cow, what if this does get out? That's how people find themselves in the world to hurt. The mindset should, we should be teaching and reinforcing is, are you taking a tool that connects you to the world? And are you using that mindset to show the world how beautiful you can be? Because if this was the mindset installed and reinforced from a young age, just like we do with so many other mindsets, then through elementary, middle, and high school, as kids are using different tools and platforms, they're understanding that if they're posting amazing things, that they can open incredible windows of opportunity. And what happens is our tools and our apps become irrelevant. And tools and apps become irrelevant because tools and apps will always change. Just look where we've come in the last 10 years, 20 years. But the mindset a human applies to the power of any tool is what matters. And if we can help our kids apply the right mindset to their digital decision making, then they will open windows of opportunity that past generations never dreamed possible. And they will keep their risks in the digital world extraordinarily low, no matter how fast we go. Now I'm gonna jump really quickly to gaming here because again, we only have 10 minutes and gaming is a huge question I get asked about all the time. How do I stay safe or keep my kids safe while they're communicating and gaming? So here's the tip. If we would not say it or take it from a stranger in the local arcade, then please don't ever say it or take it in the global arcade. Because the only difference between the local arcade and the global arcade is that there's a few hundred people in the building. There's millions of people here. And when a human starts oversharing personal information in this world, that's when risk levels will go up. So try and help them keep that conversation to the game. If they're communicating and gaming, put a post-it note right there on the Xbox, the PlayStation, keep conversation to game. Because if they can do that, they can keep the risks really low. But you know, when I talk to them with third graders and I say, hey, let's say we went to Dave and Buster's and we're playing a game and you're playing with a complete stranger and that person's awesome at the game and you're having a good time and you're high five. And I mean, this happens every day online and off. But when I say to them, if that person turned to you and said, hey, great job, where do you live? Where do you go to school? What's your cell phone number? Here's a box, take it. I think you're gonna take that box? And every kid says no. But the same kid who looks you in the eyes and says they won't take the box from the stranger at Dave and Buster's You'll watch them download a link from a complete stranger in here, and they get hacked in a game like Roblox 10 minutes later, putting themselves, their family, and their friends' security at risk. So again, if your kids are communicating while they're gaming online, 
please help them keep that conversation to the game. Be aware enough to know if people are picking them for personal information, because if they keep talking only about that game, risks stay low and entertainment stays high. And that's the whole point of gaming. Now, social media, I'm not here to kill social media, but here's the thing. The problem with social media is social and private is an oxymoron, right? From day one, the problem is tech companies have set the wrong expectation and they've called these things privacy settings. And so people for years have had this false expectation of privacy. If you go all the way back to MySpace almost 20 years ago at the day of this webinar right now, it's kind of crazy how old that is. If you look specifically at the people who got in trouble in social media 20 years ago, you know what you'll find? They were getting in the exact same trouble they're getting into today. The only thing that humans have changed in two decades of time is not the way they think about technology. You know what we keep changing? The name of the app. And so why for 20 plus years, we have this perpetual cycle of insanity happening with people getting in the exact same trouble over and over and over again. Well, one of the biggest reasons is because tech companies called them privacy settings and they set the wrong expectation for generations. What they should have done is just been honest with the public from day one. And ladies and gentlemen, here's the honesty. This comes from somebody who's been in tech from the 90s. There is no such thing as a privacy setting in a world that was built from the ground up for communication. This is a pipe dream. What we are all using, maybe you have passcodes, pass keys, pins, biometrics like face ID and thumbprint. What we are all using are not privacy settings. They are visibility or transparency settings because that's all humans are trying to do every day. Every day we are trying to limit third party visibility into our windows to the world. And please try not to refer to this as a phone, but rather a window to the world. Because when people see this as a phone, they see it as their phone, their screen, their password, they can do whatever they want. So they take liberties. And they forget about the fact that that thing right there has Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and data, not to mention clouds and servers backing information up. Think of this as a window to the world and explain to them windows work two ways. If there's a connection out, there's a potential connection in. And again, social privacy, is an oxymoron. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't be using those settings. We should absolutely use the settings. What I'm saying is when you hear a tech company say the word private, try and pull that out of your kid's head and bring in the word visibility. An activity you could do at home, have your kids look out an open window and say, hey, can you see out that window? Can people see in? They are going to say, yes, that's public. Now, draw some blinds over the window and say, go look through that window. If they walk over to the blinds and they peek through the blinds, they can still see through the window. They're just making it harder for that to happen. Explain to them, that is the mindset they should have about visibility settings on their windows to the world. Because when we understand it's not absolutely private, what you're doing is you're just trying to make it harder for things to get out and people to see in. We think more clearly and more prudently. When I ask people, every time a new form of technology comes out, new phone, new app, new device comes out, I say, what does that make it faster and easier for humans to do with each other? Do you want to know what I get every single time I ask that question? And by the way, for 13 years, I do 200 programs a year. Last year was 311 days. Every time I ask that question, I get the answer on the screen. doesn't matter if it's a third grader, a 13-year-old, or a 30-year-old, because they're right. And that answer right there is why there's no such thing as social privacy in this world. Because if every single hole in privacy was patched up right now, by this time tomorrow, there will be more holes. Why? Because every advance in technology is purposely designed to make it faster and easier for things to get out. If I go to every one of your communities, everybody watching this right now, and I said to every person in your community, I'll pay for your data the rest of the year. You want 3G, 4G, or 5G speed? What do you think people will pick? Humans will always want faster. They're going to pick five. So please explain to your kids that as technology goes faster, then so too can they use that tool to go faster to where they want to go. What is B for them from A to B? College, job, scholarship? Like your car gets you home faster than walking. Using technology with wisdom, you can get there faster. But if we are making blind decisions, not informed ones, and we believe truly that what we're putting into a world of communication can stay private, even though all you have to do is literally take a picture of it and share it around the world, this is when problems happen. When people take liberties on these devices and they don't realize that thing they may not want the world to see, well, every day that platform is becoming faster. And therefore, every day is becoming faster to get out. Really quickly, I just want to touch on empathy because that was already mentioned and it's extremely important in the digital world. As technology moves faster, not only can we affect ourselves faster, we can affect others faster. And so for the need for mindfulness and empathy in the digital world is paramount. I can't put into words for you how much faster and easier it's becoming to capture and share content. So I'll quickly show you with some tech. The Ray-Bans I have on, there are cameras pointed at you right now. Most people wouldn't know that. If I say Facebook, take a picture, Facebook, shoot video, it will do it. And then I can just hands-free drop it into my phone and out it goes. These glasses are for Snapchat. I can do the same thing. 
if we want our children and ourselves to be able to go to a party and have fun, a social gathering and have fun, and we should be able to do this, we're human beings. If we want to be, out to be able to go out to public and not have other people film us because literally all they have to do is look at you to do it and you won't know they're doing it. If we want people to have an empathy and a mindfulness first, you know what, what you're doing at this party is hysterical. But if I film you and put you online right now, let me stop and think. Can I get you thrown out of school, thrown off the team, cost you a scholarship, cost you a job, your family, your friends, your reputation, your legacy? Would you want what I'm about to do to you and you have no idea I'm about to do it to you? Would you want this to be public and permanent? If we want people to think that way before they just snap and shoot and put somebody online, then we really do need a change in our thinking because we all have dull moments, right? And what goes through the mind of a human when they have a dull moment? <laughs> I hope nobody saw that. The problem is there's cameras everywhere. And most times people don't even realize there's one pointed at them. And so if we want people to be mindful before they post that, then we really do need a change in our thinking. This mindset should never be a negative. I tell people all the time, if you see that as negative, you have to change the way you think about tech because you're putting things in a world of communication you don't want communicated. And if you think about anyone you've ever heard of that got in trouble in tech, that's what they did. They put content into a world of communication they didn't want communicated. Let's go back to this guideline right here. A long time ago, we discovered fire, right? A long time ago, like we're not new at fire. And after we discovered it, what happened? We, a lot of people got hurt. And then we applied a thoughtfulness called playing with fire can burn. Everyone watching this has heard that for generations. We've heard that, that we passed that mindfulness down for generations. And as we passed that mindfulness down, we invented tools that harness the power of fire, right? Once I do this, the tool doesn't matter. This could be a candle, a book of matches, a lighter. Who cares what this is? When this comes out of it, we understand how to harness the power. And we understand how to harness it instinctually. We know if we put our hand over it on a cold day, it feels good. If we put our hand in it on any day, it will hurt. But instinctually understanding how to harness this tool makes this tool irrelevant. This could be a candle, a book of matches, a lighter. Who cares what it is? Understanding how to harness that is what matters. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what's on your screen for the 21st century flame. Tools and apps will always change and always evolve, just like these did. But if we can apply the right mindset, it does not matter how fast we go in this world. Your children, your children's children, will do things that previous generations would have never thought possible if they are using this tool with wisdom. So thank you so much for sitting back and uh, hopefully catching all of the words that I just said in 10 or so minutes. <laughs> Thanks so much, um, Richard, for a very, very full presentation <laughs> for us. Um, and I'm going to ask just a quick question before we move on to our next segment. I want um, your favorite question to ask you how to help teens create a healthy relationship with technology. So it's a great question. First of all, when I'm talking to students, I always try and help them, number one, be leaders and mentors, because uh, there are a lot of kids who are older and younger kids will listen to them. And so we want older kids to be an ambassador to younger kids as to how to use technology responsibly. I also try and help them understand, you know, if you talk to a lot of kids, they will tell you there's influencers that they follow. I could show you kids at 12 years old who are already self-made millionaires based on what they've done in YouTube. That is something that I never would have thought possible when I was 12 years old. But it's also about helping them understand that there's a respect for the technology they have to use, and just like any other tool. What we did, and I think kids truly understand this and appreciate this, what we did is we passed out very powerful tools to everybody on the planet. You know, if you go to the store and you buy a, a, a toy or a, anything, what do you see on the packaging? Instructions, warnings, directions. But in the digital world, we didn't do that. We didn't give a mindfulness. We didn't give instructions. We just unbox and we go. Some people don't even unbox their own stuff. They go to the tech store. The person at the tech store unboxes it, hands it to them, and they go. And we never gave that thought system on how to use it. And I think kids appreciate when I say to them, they have essentially been made the guinea pigs of technology. Everyone you watching this, you are all guinea pigs of technology. Why? When a new app, a new platform, a new game comes out, who's the first people to use it? And as the first users of technology, we are essentially creating data. And through human behavior, we are becoming statistics. And humans across this globe are becoming statistics of promise and pitfalls for the next generation to learn from. And so what I try and help students understand is that if you can use this the right way, you can become one of the many statistics of promise, not pitfalls that will come out of our generation. And the next generation needs statistics of pitfalls. Like everybody watching this, there was a time we didn't know the health effects of smoking. It took a lot of people to get hurt first for us to know that. 
There was a time we didn't know the health effects of concussions. It took a lot of people to get hurt first for us to know that. And the same is true in the digital world. First generation always pays the price for the next generation. That's the way life goes. And as the first digital generation, this is what we see happening around us every day. And so when I talk to kids and I help them see the power of technology and I walk that fine line of this is where you can go, up or down, I think they appreciate that. But somebody has to give them the mindset and the thought system to use. Because what we did was we said, here you go. Then we waited for people to get in trouble. Then we slapped the label like sexting on it. And then we brought everybody in for the fire or for the workshop. It's almost like we give everybody matches on the planet, waited for them to burn their houses down, and then brought them in for the fire safety workshop. Why not give them the way to use that technology first? You know, when I see a, par a parent or a teacher or a coach tell a 17-year-old, don't use social media, that's not guidance. You can't tell a 17-year-old kid, hey, just don't use social media if you're going to put this in their hand. That's like saying, hey, go get your license. You got your license? Awesome. Here's the keys to your brand new car, but you can't drive it. What it's all about is helping them drive it, drive it responsibly, and like anything else with moderation, use it the right way, use the power to your advantage, and open windows of opportunity. And in the very brief time I have to try and explain that, this is the way in which I, through 70 minutes, reach kids. <laughs> Thanks so much, Richard. That's really wonderful. Um, we're going to shift gears a little bit here because um, we asked a youth research group that is involved from Vancouver, um, a Asia Pacific group of youth who volunteered to be involved in a project about confidence in communication, which was partly sparked by Sherry's book um, on reclaiming communication. And these young people volunteered to give us their opinions on technology for this session today. But also, I just want you to know that they are um, students who volunteer to be peer mentors and to work on workshop, uh, to be facilitators in workshops that we have developed to help young people gain confidence in communication, whether it's online or face to face. <laughs> so we're going to see what some of these youth have told us. I think in this day and age, no young person goes without um, online communication. But while it can be helpful for connecting us instantaneously, I feel like it can give us the, the illusion of having a deep connection while um, at the same time being quite superficial. Because um, with its ease and the availability of people to talk to, um, I think it can be easier to form connections, but not as easy to really deepen those connections or even um, maintain strong connections. I've seen digital communication be quite helpful in my life, um, but it's also been quite harmful. I see that it's really, really good for keeping in touch with people that you otherwise wouldn't be able to keep in touch with. In terms of meeting new people online, I've had those experiences too, but I'd say that they aren't as solid relationships as I had with people that I met offline. Online communication is, you know, it's, uh, how, how to put it, it's way less efficient than in person, say, especially for texting, right? A single conversation over text that can go on for hours usually is done within like 10 minutes of just talking to each other face by face. I've found that this has been an issue for me in the past. I'm trying to, you know, remedy it, you know, being stricter about how much time I spend on the internet, but it, but it's a little tough. It's a little tough sometimes. A lot of um, social media apps these days take a look at Facebook. They, they have like what? Facebook dating, Facebook gaming, Facebook reels, stories, posts, uh, ev everything. But what, what I'm trying to say is that it feels like a lot of them are actually, you know, crowding out, you know, some, some interactions or things that we'd rather have done in person. I feel that we need to teach young people that there is a person on the end of the screen and that they themselves are a person at their end of the screen as well. They're not like a part of an echo chamber. You know, you just have to remember that behind the screen, it's it's a real living, breathing, feeling person. Uh, sometimes, oh, you know, when there's the distance of the internet involved, we tend to forget that. We just view them as, you know, words, words on the screen, and that will affect the way we think about them, the way we talk to them. But if you wouldn't say it to their their face, I would I would say it's a bad idea to say it over the internet as well. So one thing I believe that a lot of uh, 
people, especially the older generations, not you, Dr. Cameron, but uh, some people of the older generations uh, have a little trouble understanding is that while, yes, you know, the Internet is a much less, you know, private, much less, you know, a much more permanent place, a much more open place, there's still like we still expect, you know, an element of, of privacy. It's I think uh, what parents can sometimes struggle to understand uh, is that it is possible to make Internet friends. Um, and part of their concern comes from how they're looking out for our safety and like what if what if it's secretly a 35 year old man trying to, I don't know, find your location. Um, but no, I think there's, I think sometimes parents can be paranoid about like the people you get to know online. Out of the mouths of youth. Um, the wisdom that the experience is teaching these young people and how they want to pass it on to younger teenagers and even um, elementary school age children is pretty impressive. I'm going to move on now to Dr. Sebastian Wax, who is a visiting professor um, for education and socialization theory at the Department of Educational Studies at the University of Potsdam and an honorary research fellow at the National Anti-Bullying Research and Resource Center. He recently developed an anti-hate speech prevention program called Hate Less, Together Against Hatred, which is currently being evaluated in German schools. Um, so I would like to invite Sebastian to talk to us about the strengths of the work that he's doing to help young people to counteract um, hate speech um, and what that all involves. So please show us, Sebastian. Hello, thank you so much for having me. So I would like to talk with you today about hate speech, which is a current online risk, which is not only an issue among adults, but also um, adolescents. I would like to start with a brief definition. And it's fair to say that the term hate speech was originally coined by the American law professor Marie Matsuda in the late 80s. Matsuda observed this kind of violence at her university and she asked or she called for legal sanctions of this specific type of violence. Since then, a panoply of different definitions and uses can be found and what you in the US are understanding um, among hate speech is quite different from what we in Germany would consider as hate speech, which is related to different historical e events, etc. There are two common myths when we use the term hate speech, which were um, described by Alexander Brown. The first myth is the myth of hate in hate speech. Hate speech is not always motivated by hatred. In fact, there are many different motivations which explain why people engage in it. Um, the second myth is the myth of speech and hate speech. Hate speech is not only expressed by words. This might be the case in the late 80s, but today we see hate speech is often expressed in posts, memes, images or videos uh, on the social media platforms. So we developed the following definition based on the systematic review of current research. And this definition of hate speech reads as follow. Hate speech is a derogatory expression about people based on assigned or actual group characteristics, for example, sexual orientation, religion, or ethnicity. Hate speech is based on an intention to harm, and it has the potential to cause harm on multiple levels not only on the individual level, but also on the communal or societal level, which we can observe in many uh, societies around the world in the current days. So one question is, which, um, which is quite important to answer, is hate speech harmful to young people? And the easy answer is yes. But what are young people telling us about what what is it like to experience hate speech? So we conducted qualitative interviews with students to understand their perspective. And I show you here some quotes 
what what students told us how it, how does it feel to experience or be the target of hate speech so there was one student who said that is something that really depresses you another student said well i was terrified to go through school like that this person was attacked um, by hate speech in the school context um, another person said people who can't handle it just break down and there's another quote um, which was a quote i had to think a lot about that um, it said well it's enough for me if someone tells me i stand behind you that gives you a good feeling and ensures that you don't feel alone in this world so on the one hand this quote is telling us that hate speech is harmful on the other hand, it shows us that there is an opportunity to help victims of hate speech. And this quote inspired following up research. And this was a quantitative questionnaire research study. And in this study, we investigated the relationship between hate speech victimization and depressive symptoms. First, we found that there is a positive relationship. That means that the more hate speech victimization students reported, the more likely they were to report depressive symptoms as well. So, but in this quote I just mentioned, the last one, there is something like students or adolescents, um, it, it helps them when they have someone who is standing behind them. And this could be operationalized like um, social resources and a kind of resilience. So we investigated in the study how resilience will buffer the association between hate speech victimization and depressive symptoms. And in fact, it did. So that means that if students have resilience, they um, are less likely to show depressive symptoms if they experience hate speech victimization. So hate speech is harmful. And I think all of us can imagine that. So the another question is, why do young people engage in hate speech if it is harmful? We did also research on this question, and we found that there are many different motivations why adolescents engage in hate speech. Revenge, ideology, group conformity, status enhancement, acceleration, and power. So we need to consider not only personal uh, variables, but also the, the school context, the classroom context, or uh, for example, the online environment, the online peer environment, to understand why adolescent, uh, adolescents engage in hate speech. On my last topic, I want to briefly talk with you about what role do parents play in decreasing their children's risk of hate speech victimization. We did several studies on this issue. And first of all, one basic um, note is here, parents matter. We, we found that, for example, instructive parental mediation is negatively related to hate speech victimization, whereas restrictive mediation is positively linked to victimization. So it is not only an issue if you um, if you take care or if you consider um, or if you influence the way how your children interact in the online world, but it's more a question how you do it, be instructive. Um, we also found that instructive parental mediation um, is positively linked to constructive coping. So you can't not only influence the risk of victimization of your child, but also you can influence how your child will cope with certain um, dangerous situations related to online hate speech if you use some specific kind of parental mediation. Um, another finding was that sharing might increase the risk of hate speech victimization. So you should be aware or you should consider what kind of information you share about your child in the online world. And lastly, um, another finding was that we found that anti-hate speech norm within families are negatively related um, to adolescents' hate speech perpetration. So be clear about hate speech and that you condemn this behavior. It will have an influence of the behavior of your child. 
Um, I have three take home messages for you today. Um, the first take home message is hate speech fulfills various functions serving as a defense against a perceived threat, conveying a feeling of power or instrumentally improving one's position in the social group. So you need to ask your child or you need to understand why your child is engaging in hate speech. And there are many different reasons why this might be the case. Hate speech experiences can impact young people's well-being, but we can support their development despite negative online hate speech uh, victimization experiences by improving their resilience. And lastly, and parents matter, try to implement instructive mediation, mediation strategies and avoid just using restrictive strategies. Of course, this must be related to the age appropriateness uh, of your child, but it's important that you um, think about the way how you educate the uh, media activities of your child. There's this quote, it takes a village to educate a child and regarding hate speech, it takes the whole society to tackle hate speech. And I think everyone should be responsible or feel responsible to play a role in tackling hate speech within our societies. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sebastian. Um, that really hits home for me, partly because in one study that we conducted with with a visual, visually um, uh, diverse students in Vancouver, uh, one of the things that the students said was that the bystander makes a difference. And that if the teacher stands by and doesn't say even something as simple as that must have made you feel bad, mm -hmm. that amplified the feeling of really horrible despair that was the result of the unkind act or speech and that we all have a part to play in commenting when we hear something that's unkind um, even simply to say to the person the victim in that case it must have felt bad and that's a simple thing that we can do um, one question that I wanted to ask you was how do you advise people to teach kids to communicate respectfully online? Well, I think the best way to teach your child respect is to treat your child with respect and um, to be a role model. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. we make mistakes. And this is what Sherry already said um, when she talked about her mentoring relationship. Making mistakes is human and that's perfectly fine. But if you make mistakes and your child is witnessing those, um, explain your child why you acted online in a not, not uh, appropriate or perfectly fine manner. And maybe explain your child how you can act or yeah, how you can act differently next time. Um, you can also use role plays um, to explain your child how uh, your child should um, behave in a certain online situation. You might want to ask questions like, why is this and this behavior unacceptable? Or how could you, uh, or how would it make you feel if you experienced or witnessed something like this? Um, I think another issue is that we need to, to explain children that um, if we communicate online, um, this has an impact of, uh, on our behavior, like the toxic online disinhibition effect is quite common. But um, it's important to highlight also benefits. You know, remember the ice bucket challenge. It's not, people are not only behaving online um, more toxic, but also more benign. And bringing this balanced view of online behavior is also quite important, I think. Thank yeah. you. So um, we're going to move back to our youth voices for a moment, and here we ask them a question about what their hopes and concerns are for the future with technology and communications, and 
face-to-face -face communications. I must say that um, this session, this piece that you're going to hear is more optimistic than I heard the students when I talked with them. They were more stymied when asked what the hopes were and what the positives were and much more concerned about the negatives. But nevertheless, let's hear what their positive ideas are. I think in this day and age, no young person goes without um, online communication, but while it can be helpful for connecting us instantaneously, I feel like it can give us the, the illusion of having a deep connection while um, at the same time being quite superficial. Because um, with its ease and the availability of people to talk to, um, I think it can be easier to form connections, but not as easy to really deepen those connections or even um, maintain strong connections. I've seen digital communication be quite helpful in my life, um, but it's also been quite harmful. I see that it's really, really good for keeping in touch with people that you otherwise wouldn't be able to keep in touch with. In terms of meeting new people online, I've had those experiences too, but I'd say that they aren't as solid relationships as I had with people that I met offline. Online communication is, you know, it's, uh, how, how to put it, it's way less efficient than in person, say, especially for texting, right? A single conversation over text that can go on for hours usually is done within like 10 minutes of just talking to each other face by face. I've found that this has been an issue for me in the past. I'm trying to, you know, remedy it, you know, being stricter about how much time I spend on the internet, but it, but it's a little tough. It's a little tough sometimes. A lot of, um, social media apps these days take a look at Facebook. They, they have like what Facebook dating, Facebook gaming, Facebook reels, stories, posts, uh, ev everything. But what, what I'm trying to say is that it feels like a lot of them are actually, you know, crowding out, you know, some, some interactions or things that we'd rather have done in person. I feel that we need to teach young people that there is a person on the end of the screen and that they themselves are a person at their end of the screen as well. They're not like a part of an echo chamber. You know, you just have to remember that behind the screen, it's it's a real living, breathing, feeling person. Uh, sometimes, oh, you know, when there's the distance of the internet involved, we t tend to forget that. We just view them as, you know, words, words on the screen, and that will affect the way we think about them, the way we talk to them. But if you wouldn't say it to their their face, I would I would say it's a bad idea to say it over the internet as well. So one thing I believe that a lot of uh, people, especially the older generations, not you, Dr. Cameron, but uh, some people of the older generations uh, have a little trouble understanding is that while, yes, you know, the Internet is a much less, you know, private, much less, you know, a much more permanent place, a much more open place, there's still like we still expect, you know, an element of, of privacy. It's I think uh, what parents can sometimes struggle to understand uh, is that it is possible to make internet friends. Um, and part of their concern comes from how they're looking out for our safety. And like, what if, what if it's secretly a 35 year old man trying to, I don't know, find your location. Um, but no, I think there's, I think sometimes parents can be paranoid about like the people you get to know online. There we go again. Um, we are now going to be moving into a Q&A session with um, our audience um, members. And uh, But before I do that, I'm thinking it might be a good idea, given what I'm hearing from our, our panelists, if we have a little round, not too long a round, because we do have lots of questions coming from the audience. But if anybody wants to make comment on what one of the other panelists has said, I'd like to open the floor to that first. Sherry. Yeah, Richard and I had some interesting uh, crosstalk in the chat uh, that I thought might be interesting for the, we kind of made a day to talk further, but I thought it made, would be interesting for the audience to hear. I was curious, uh, you know, so many of the, um, uh, of the harms that uh, social media uh, inflicts uh, really are rooted very deeply in the algorithms of social media. Yeah. So in other words, uh, Facebook, uh, to take one, 
um, the algorithm is uh, make people mad right. and then keep them with other people who are mad in the same thing, keep you with people who are mad in the same way so that you you're mad and then you're mad with like minded people. You know, exactly what our democracy doesn't need. I mean, that was kind of my, my, my points perhaps too quickly made about, you know, democracies being undermined by social media come really from the fundamental algorithms of Facebook. Yep. So um, in your comments about um, sensible, uh, um, uh, educated use of a tool, if you're, I, I thought that I just wanted to hear you say more about your analogy with fire. Yeah, absolutely. If, you're, if, if, you, if you have matches, I'm in control in my home about, you know, really how I use my matches and how I teach my child to use my matches. Yeah. If I'm contemplating the Facebook algorithm, putting myself into literally Enjoying the Facebook algorithm puts me into a world of their psychological manipulation of me. Yeah. Where I don't have, um, you know, I'm already part of the game when I join. So it, that's why my remedies always include, um, I didn't get to remedies in my conversation, but I tried to talk about politics, always include a kind of political um, piece. And I'm wondering if in your remedies, you're asking people to just do a personal thing in terms of, uh, or also to become, uh, join a consumer movement that would change these algorithms uh, themselves. Yep, so that's great. So it's actually, it's a little of both. Definitely starts with personal accountability. So like with the matches, let's say, let's take the fire outside of the home and go to the restaurant with the candle on the table. The individuals in that restaurant aren't worried about the candles on the table because we've all been conditioned for a very long time to understand the power of fire and so we have an empathy and a mindfulness on how to treat others with that that power so going back to what you're saying though with the um, ai yeah so ai's goal it's actually funny we also had the als uh, ice bucket challenge brought up right what happens in social media when you see something that's funny or heartwarming you're raising money people like it move on they like it and they move on that's what we do at the warm and the fuzzy but as we all know, watching this, there's an old saying, right? If it bleeds, it leads. So you start throwing things at an, uh, an algorithm is collecting your data. Then that AI algorithm throws things that are controversial at you. You are going to start getting engaged. And then they start throwing it at other people. And what happens to those people? They go into a rabbit hole. And that rabbit hole becomes an echo chamber. And the longer they're in that echo chamber getting mad or upset or, you know, whatever, however it is they're feeling, that's being done purposely by AI. Why? Because every page view and every moment you are on that on that platform, you're generating revenue for that company. So that is being done purposely to people. And so I try and help people understand that as well. So it's a very delicate balance of you have personal accountability, like some of the kids who were just talking said, I wish I could get rid of my footprint. And then the other young lady said, no, we have a digital footprint, right? So some of it is about understanding your personal accountability and the, and the consequences or the benefits based on what you're doing. And the other side of it, again, when we're talking to people is helping them understand that some of the things that are happening to them aren't necessarily their fault. It's because they were thrown into this world. We are the pioneers. Imagine the first people that discovered fire, you know, what they went through. I, and, and that's trivial in the sense that this is a lot more expansive than fire. But if you could just kind of but metaphor. But are you encouraging I mean, we, when we first had cars, we didn't have seat belts. We didn't have rules of the road. Right. We didn't have a social environment that controlled right. The environment Correct. of cars. So, Correct. So through think, time. Right. So are you encouraging people in your programs to develop those rules of the road, get in, you know, um, uh, argue for seat belts, argue for speed limits, argue for safer cars uh, on a social level? So are when you, I when I speak with students and parents, it's more about how do you use those tools in that car to stay safe, even if it wasn't regulated. When I speak with people who regulate or lobbyists, it's what you're talking about. You know, there's gotta be, we got, there's gotta be some kind of a change because right now we really are still in the wild west. Like we thought we were in the wild west, we're still in the wild west. So it depends on the audience is the answer to your question. And then 
you know, the other thing I would just say real quick, you know, the young man who said he thinks it would be better if we can get rid of our footprint, you know, if any parents are watching, I'll just take as an opportunity because I, I made a note and I don't want to lose it. If your kids ever do make a mistake, you know, part of growing up is making mistakes. You know what every adult I know and I, I in my entire life in technology since the 90s, every time I speak to an adult or a room of adults, I hear this every day. See if the statement sounds familiar. Man, thank God technology wasn't around when I was growing up, <laughs> right? How often do people say that? But our kids are growing up with it. And so like to the young man who said, I wish we could get rid of our footprint. This is what I tell kids. If you do make a mistake, that's part of growing up. That's why adults say they wish they wasn't around when they were growing up. But starting in that moment, learn from your mistake, especially if you have younger kids, elementary, middle school, even high school, learn from your mistake. And then in that moment, clear the slate. And starting in that moment, you make one, two, five years of amazing decisions in the digital world. If people find that mistake in a background check and they see you've done a lot of great things since, the odds are they're going to be willing to overlook the mistake you made on your time and you were dying when you were younger and supposed to. But it's also important we help people understand that repeated abuse in the digital world, it's like repeated offender and drunk driving, you're going to find that the opportunities are going to be very slim because we are in a global market at this point. Technology eliminated space and time. Look how many people are watching this from all, and it doesn't matter where you live geographically to be watching this or presenting. And when technology eliminates space and time, it removes the, na the national or local and we bring in the global environment. And so it's important our youth understand that they are competing globally. And so their, their, their behaviors do matter. So I know that was a lot there, but <laughs> maybe I answered a few questions that were lined up. Um, but yeah, I could not believe, I could not agree with you more, Sherry, that yeah, that, on this side, there's got to be some rules and regulations. You know, well, we can teach people to put the seatbelt on things like that. But sometimes, you know, they don't understand all of the dangers, why we're telling them to put the seatbelt on. And there's a lot of people who don't understand what's happening with the AI algorithms. You know, people think their phones are listening to them. They don't understand the mathematics that are happening and all the data that's happening and all the AI algorithms that are being used to take that data. It's not that your phone's listening to you. It's that there's so much data out there and the math is being done so fast by an algorithm. It can actually predict what you might want to buy or where you, where you might want to go or where you might wind up. So these are things that that transparency has to happen for sure, 100%. I, let me just say just one final thing on this is I really, I just became a grandmother. So I'm just, Congrats. I'm just, thank you. So I'm just uh, immersed in baby child products in a way that uh, I wasn't before. And, uh, you know, I actually have seen these, these, baby bouncers with a slot for an iPad and these these baby ch changers with a slot for an iPad yes. and an iPhone. It, you know, it's, it's not clear it's for the, all the programs to, you know, to distract the baby or distract the mothers and mother can take calls while she's changing the baby. I mean, I think there can be a consumer movement. I mean, I don't think we need to postpone. Yeah, till everybody understands the consumer movement that says this is too much distraction from the face-to-face -face communication that we need to yeah. keep us whole and to keep our children whole. And that doesn't mean you have to throw away your phone, but get a grip on bringing humanity back into the most intimate moments of your family life. Because I think that I, you know, I don't, I don't want to divide the world into the world of the, of the lobbyists and the corporate world and the world of the, you know, the home people, because I think that ultimately changing uh, the way these companies do business is going to be really their, it's going to be a consumer movement. So yep. anyway, enough for me. Yeah, no, 100%. I'm, I'm looking for a consumer movement. In, in, I, in Europe and other countries, there are completely different laws than in the United States as far as privacy, uh, the right to be forgotten, things of that nature. So you're uh, you're absolutely right, 100% right. Yeah. And and it does have to happen, or at least there has to be more transparency. You know, when I said earlier, we are the pioneers of technology, like we legit are the pioneers of technology. Future generations will, we will be one of the most heavily researched generation of humans to ever walk this planet because we are all the very first humans to use the tools that changed it. 
We are the humans to witness the birth of artificial intelligence and how it changed everything. We are the very first humans that will drop into what people will call the metaverse, completely alternate reality. And when future generations look back on the pioneers of technology to do that, they are going to see we had to deal with a lot of challenges because we're the first ones to go through this. And it's really important that we help, you know, another thing, again, just as, as my role trying to give do's and do's to parents, you know, a lot of kids are very impulsive in this world. Why? And Sherry, I know you, you definitely would know this. Their brain's not developed to think long-term yet. You know, you have to be like, what, 25 to 27 years old. And so a child is going to be impulsive in this world. And one conversation, and again, the sacred spaces you were talking about earlier, I love it. One of the things that um, we have to help kids understand is like, what they do in this world could stay with them positively or negatively, and they can do that in a moment. So how do we get them thinking beyond the moment? And here's a here's a tip you can do, and you can use it in the sacred space that Sherry talked about. Bring up an ad or listen to an ad for Ancestry.com. Watch it on TV. Pull it up on YouTube. Maybe before you get in the car, before dinner, watch it. Then have your kid reflect on this question. What Thanks. do you want the next generation of your family to know about you when they go to Ancestry.com and look you up to see who you were? as their digital forefather. Have them reflect on that question. Thanks, Richard. Um, this is a wonderful exchange and I'd love it to carry forward, but we do want to hear from some of the audience with their yep, questions. <laughs> we also have an exchange that we would like to carry through with, with um, Sebastian. But first I'd like to ask a rather complex question that I'm not sure that you, um, well, you're volunteer to respond to. How do you use security to protect your child without losing them to secrecy, to secrecy, to confidentiality? And I think that that is um, an important question that I'd like you to ponder. How do you use security to protect your child without losing them to presumably their own independent secrecy? Um, well, I think we need to distinguish here between uh, children and adolescents. And um, privacy is a basic human right. And also children have uh, a right for privacy, right? So um, we need to, to find a balanced way to, to shelter our children from potential harmful interaction, but on the other side, not being overprotecting and, you know, and don't allow them to develop. Um, it's quite important that children and especially adolescents um, explore the world offline and online with increasing age um, more and more alone. Right. So otherwise they don't develop the skills they need when they are grown up to 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 cope with differences, to 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 manage several challenges, uh, which this life will. Yeah, which they will face in life. So, first of all, I think it's quite important to be honest and to talk about um, what kind of if you use some kind of monitoring. Uh, software or something like that, you should be honest uh, and talk with your child about that. You should explore the internet, um, like the offline world, with your child together, talk about spaces that are safe, online websites, which are maybe not that safe. There are many regulations, and Richard already said, um, the situation in Europe is a little bit different. So I scrolled through the question, and there was... Uh, question about age and Facebook, for example, in Germany, we have clear regulations about that, that children below 13 years are not officially allowed to have an account on Facebook or even WhatsApp. So I think these, these kind of regulation, I mean, of course, all the children are using Facebook or TikTok. Nowadays, Facebook is out and all of those children have WhatsApp even below 13. But for many parents, these, these regulations might be some kind of guideline. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. I'm wondering what you would think would be the benefit of having youth engage in designing future technologies um, for communications online 
and what that might do to the algorithm versus interfaces um, influences. Anybody? Youth better engage. They better engage. It's their turn. It's their turn. Yeah, looking they've forward. grown up. I'm looking, I mean, <laughs> here, here. Yeah, they've grown up with it, right? So kind of with what we were just watching with, um, with the two videos of the students, you know, when we first watched them, I was like, were they in high school? Were they in college? Because they were, they were quite mature in, in the way they were talking and having them create what they're talking about, what they've learned through their adolescence, the challenges they've seen, even if they didn't directly have the challenge, everybody knows somebody who got in trouble with tech, right? And then we learn from why they got in trouble. And so having youth develop programs and platforms based on what they saw that they think would be better and beneficial for the next generation. Yeah. I mean, that's how it can trickle down, you know, but like Sherry said, they have to get involved. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I think there needs to be a, a deep understanding. And I think all three of your panelists are, are, you know, we're all just saying it in a different language based on our different projects. You know, there really needs to be um, a much deeper understanding of the algorithms behind social media. Yeah. And I think that's starting. I think the, uh, you know, the Facebook uh, whistleblower helped. Mm -hmm. I think the fact that Facebook was forced to say, oh yeah, I guess we did do studies of our own that showed how much damage we're doing, oops. Um, but you know, people, but then they started meta and somehow now everybody thinks the metaverse will solve these problems. I mean, there's just, there's just an infinite amount of money and publicity and uh, and public relations campaigns. And now my my feed is filled with surgeons who need Meta to do brain surgeries. Though so that's what Meta is all about. I mean, um, you're dealing with a formidable opponent, um, and you don't want to have social media as your opponent. I think we've all made the point that this this technology is good for a lot of things. It's not as though it's a bad thing. It's, it's a technology that was never put under any of the social controls, the normal uh, political and social controls that it would have been if it had really been introduced as the kind of technology it really is, which is a profound technology of communication, of information distribution, uh, and it wasn't. Uh, we, we really didn't know what it was when it was being introduced. And uh, we're only now coming around to seeing, uh, yes, it can undermine democracy. Yes, it can influence elections. Yes, I mean, we're, we're only now kind of catching up. Yes, it can influence uh, adolescent development, children's development. We're only catching up with what we've made. And that's why I like the, um, the uh, analogy to the car because you know people thought the car was a horse except it was mechanical mm -hmm. and, and then oh oops no it can change the nature of cities it makes new different kinds of cities it's going to change the entire demography of the country oh no i guess it's not a horse you know um so i i think that we need to be gentle with ourselves and, and you know kind to ourselves that it's natural that we it's taken us a while but the, the time has kind of come to face that now it's time. So I'm interested in this new generation being very active, but also in their having a good understanding of what it is that has been created. I, uh, welcome to the Grand Motherhood Club. Um, I also <laughs> realized I'm so that when I met my latest great granddaughter i was a, a bit there when she had her first social smile and my parents weren't sure it was a smile and i was because so many but it does start at the cradle it does start with conversations yes. at the very beginning of time yes. and although we don't want to discourage parents of teenagers that a lot of a lot's gone on it is also the case that young parents can object if the stuff that they're being sold um, is counter to the development of their baby. 
Yes. No, I see this as ultimately going to be a consumer movement. And I know that sounds maybe old fashioned or retro or, but these are companies who are making money on a technology that really could be, you know, yeah, I mean, for the good. And yeah, uh, yeah. it's not being used for the good in large part because there are so many uses of it on which you can make so much money when it's used for the bad. I mean, right. that's kind of very bottom line. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, there's just so much money. There's a lot of money you can make on matches caused to start fires to collect insurance. And we just, you know, we just really have laws that make that hard to do. And um, I kind of see, I kind of see a lot of what's going on online is, is starting fires for which people want to collect insurance money. <laughs> Sebastian, uh, you're dying to get in here in the conversation. Yeah, thanks so much. This is certainly true, but please, uh, we should also consider that adolescents um, are already shaping the online world like no generation before. And we shouldn't just talk about consumer. Of course, they are consumer, but they are also prosumer, right? They are producing so much online content, and they are also, some of them are making their life with it. So. I think no generation before had such a great um, economic impact, no um, young generation before, like the generation today. And the whole online world, I just said that uh, Facebook is out. Who did decide this? Not me, not you. The youth did, right? They decided, no, we don't want to go to Facebook anymore. We like TikTok. And so this whole new of short video clips uh, is booming. And maybe in two years, there's something uh, new again. And it's more like that the youth is saying what they want and they are doing it. And the tech companies are following and are giving uh, adolescents more or less what they want. So it's more like, of course, the tech companies are making money with it, sure. But at the end, adolescents are not only consumer of digital media, but also they are producing digital media and they are the architectures of the new online world. So I would like yeah. to- No, no, 100% right. Like, like I said earlier, there's 12 year olds who are already self-made millionaires, right? You can literally have your own QVC from your own house and you, I mean, it's incredible, right? Uh, I mean, you're making candles, you're making jewelry, you're making for, uh, uh, clothing from home and people are paying you through Venmo. And of course, you know, there's there's risks in that, but there's also it's very entrepreneurial. And, you know, the, if I just was going to try and bridge the conversations, like I'll use a car, OK, if I get in a car and I'm trying to get from A to B and maybe for me in that car, it's going to get to the store and I drive my car defensively. I can't control what everybody else does, but I can control what I do. And I'm going to get to the store faster than walking. So I love my car and I'm always going to use it. If I get in my car drunk or I'm texting and driving, I might never get to be. And because I'm abusing that tool, I'm elevating everybody's risk. Now, going back to regulation, if there's no regulation to tell me don't drink and drive or don't, you know what I mean? Like, Okay, well, then there's the Wild West, but we put the regulation in, we expect people to do it. And then when we use those regulations to our advantage, everybody benefits from the tool and we keep people's risks low. So going back now to what you're saying, Sebastian, yeah, there's a million, like so many things kids can do entrepreneurial. And what we just try and um, help them understand is if you can make that work for you, but you can also be aware that like, if your mental health is suffering, because like the hate you're seeing hate speech or you're seeing things online, like an algorithm is feeding you self-harm or uh, anorexia or what have you. You just have to know that that is being done purposely and to put that in its place and un try and change the algorithm through your actions. So again, it's just about really understanding that, um, I, I just try and help people understand that we are still new at this, use that to your advantage, man, go go be that you know influencer. If, you, if they really, that's what you wanna do, you wanna make your own clothes, but also be aware of the time that you're spending online. And in that time you're spending online, if your mental health is suffering based on what you're seeing, maybe it's the going back to the car again, the billboards on the road are just very harmful to your mental health, hate speech or what have you. Mm -hmm. Then take a step back, take a breath and understand, try and how, how do you have that? And you're using it to your advantage, but you're staying healthy as well. And understanding that the things that are those billboards you're seeing, that's being done purposely to profit from you. 
of so course, you need life skills, right? You need life skills. And those life skills are should be related or usable in the online and the offline world. Yeah, exactly. But we also know from research that um, teens who struggle in the offline world are most likely the one who struggle in the offline world. So there's a correlation between um, both worlds and uh, foremost uh, among the adolescents who are not capable to deal with specific tasks in the online and offline world. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. This has been too much fun, folks. <laughs> too much fun. I've been alerted that we have been using up our time very well. Oh. And so <laughs> here we are. Celeste is here to crack the whip and tie us all up. Uh, thank you, Anne, Sherry, uh, Richard, and Sebastian for sharing your expertise with us today and helping us better understand and contextualize the modern world of online communication that children are growing up in today. To learn more about child development and digital media, check out our website at childrenandscreens.com. Uh, follow us on these platforms and subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find all of our previous webinars. Please join us again on Wednesday, November 9th for our next Ex the Experts webinar, Disconnected Relationships in the Digital Age. This webinar will take the next step in examining how the near ubiquitous use of smartphones and other technologies is impacting the many relationships in youth's lives from their families to their peers and dating partners to parasocial relationships with celebrities and influencers. We hope to see you there.